modification of teeth in the House Dental Articulator. And he said to Howard, he said, Howard, is there anyone in this country or anyone in the world who knows more about ear, nose, and throat than you do? <laughs> well, yeah, of course. Yeah. So he uh, said, well, I'm going to loan you $5,000 in 1937, and I want you to go to these different places, and I want you to uh, talk to these people. I want you to watch them, how they work. At that point, Howard was interested in uh, plastic surgery and nasal reconstruction. And he felt that there were plastic surgeons who were doing great plastic surgery work on the outside of the nose, but they weren't taking into, into account the function of the nose. So he thought he could probably do that well. So he spent several months as a plastic surgeon in the Los Angeles area. And then he went traveling. So he went to Iowa and visited Dean Lowry. And what he saw there was subspecialization. Presented a letter from 
introduction to the motion. Well, Leopard was very impressed. And for those who don't know anything about Leopard, he really didn't take formal training. He went to the various hospitals in New York and he watched people. And as he watched them, he would you know, be interested, he would learn these procedures. And then they finally would realize after a while that this guy was just hanging around and they would ask him politely not to. He would go to another hospital and hang around until they got kicked out there. And so finally he started his own practice. And when he did, uh, he found that he sent notes to all of the general practitioners in New York. Uh, if you send me your patients for surgery, I will, uh, I will send you half the fee, which he did. And of course his practice was quite, quite successful at that point. And that was doing general care and open throat. Uh, and then uh, in 19, maybe 34, 35, 36, uh, and then, of course, 1937, when he heard Sortie's uh, speech. Uh, but during that time, his 14-year-old son passed away with leukemia and did this procedure. Well, Howard then was one of his first visitors, and so he was thrilled to have Howard House visit him at the recommendation of Harris B. Mosher. And he arrived, and uh, Leopard said, where are you staying? He said, well, I'm staying down at Times Square in a little flea bag motel. motel. He said, oh, that won't do. I'm going to have you go to the closet. And unfortunately, he couldn't afford the closet. But uh, Leopard said, okay, no, don't worry about it, I'll take care of it. He did, he paid his, for his room the whole time he was there visiting. Uh, he also took him to the 21 Club every night for dinner. So he did really, really quite an impressive thing. But that was a turning point for our house because now he saw something that, for the first time, we're able to restore here any patients who would be poor. But a person who's got an eye goes, in fact, he was told, don't diagnose all the cirrhosis. Because if you do, you're condemning someone to progressive hearing loss. And, you know, in some cases, that gets deafness. And so that they didn't like to tell people they had all the cirrhosis for that reason. Well, now they had an operation that he saw, and in fact, was successful. Because while he was there, he saw the surgery, and then he also saw the opportunity to see the post-operative patients. So he was extremely impressed. And this kind of, this definitely changed the direction of his ideas and we can then want to go into uh, more or less ontology. This next video is a video that, that Leonard put together. Uh, some of you were here yesterday, I guess, when he uh, would ramble on for an hour. Uh, and uh, this is quite an impressive speaker, even though Howard didn't understand much of what he said. But he, he, he got the instruments, he went to the instrument maker to get instruments that he could then used for the penetration, and he was given a box of instruments that Leopard had rejected. So he ended up with Leopard's instruments and then did lots of dissections. And I, my mother was with him at that time, and I remember she was saying that, you know, every time they would try to do something, he would, he would have the opportunity to get a dissection specimen, and he would then go to his uh, specimen, or my mother would go to the bedroom or go somewhere, and just like things that you have seen. Well, Howard was very upset. Uh, he told my mom, he says, you know, I'm really worried because I know that uh, Bozier wants me to say, you know, you're very fortunate to, to be in Boston because everything in the world is right here. You didn't need to go travel to these different places that, that I did because everything I've seen is, is right here. Well, he couldn't say that. So he came in and the, uh, the room was full. Bozier uh, came in with his entourage and sitting right in the front row. And so Howard started to begin to talk about all the places that he had been, the things he had seen, the people he had viewed. And then at the end of the talk, he said, you know, you're very fortunate to, to be in Boston because you're very close to New York. And there's a fellow by the name of Leopard. He's doing fantastic things. And so Bozier stood up. So Dr. House, you're a very young man. You have to learn to keep your eyes and ears open and your big mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> and he stormed out. Well, Howard thought, well, that's the end of my career. <laughs> because Mojo was a very important person. And, uh, and he thought he would never get into the logical society as an example. And uh, he didn't even go down to me because it was like my half uncle. But also, uh, my widow, the, the grandfather, my grandfather, and Howard's father uh, remarried the cousin of his wife. Uh, so therefore, I basically Bill was my half brother and my half uncle and my half cousin. So it's very interesting. But Bill joined, and Bill said, "You know, Howard, you, you have done everything since 1955, 1956. You have done everything uh, in uh, middle ear, and you cured everything. And so I'm going to do work in the inner ear. And so that's what he decided to do. And then in 1957, he read an article by Fisher 
Letourneau and Iris in Paris that talked about the first cochlear implant. And that was an alternating current transmitter. Uh, one of them was an otologic surgeon and another uh, was a electrophysiologist. And three gold plated ball uh, electrodes, I mean, one electrode in three different patients. Unfortunately, they did not, they worked, but there was issues with infection. So he stopped and did more study and get into that. And then uh, so Blair Simmons at Stanford was doing this. Six on the four, we had the uh, first international meeting on electrical stimulation. And this was the concluding remarks of Dr. Dr. Hal Shutnick from the Mass Eye and Ear. And he interpreted the movies and the case presentations to confirm his suspicions that the processes that they are now designed are very little use. And I'll admit we need a new operation in otology, but this is not it. So that was his comments uh, of, regarding the cochlear implant. And then, by the way, for those who didn't know, and I learned, I read another book that uh, showed that it was a war hero. Uh, he was a flight surgeon, pulled a pilot out of a burning plane. He was really a wonderful person. But he did accept the cochlear implant. And Nelson Kang here, also from Mass Eye and Air, uh, basically he was an electrophysiologist, said it wouldn't work based on didn't understand the auditory system and the coding system of the auditory. We needed to have more study before we would give the implants. And, and that's uh, basically what his comment. Uh, I saw that he was with Bruce and uh, with the uh, outside of medicine. So look at the movie industry, for example. 3D technology has been around for 20, 30 years. And we're since it's just introduced. And we're not using it. Exactly. Yeah. You have enough light even when working in a journey, and we will, you will see that in a few minutes. I mean, you can see, it's, it's like if uh, I have recorded it through a microscope. Uh, it's the same. That is only increasing. By 2050, 900 million people will have disabling hearing loss.